for having me. Um, I'm Ben. I work at Facebook on what we call the JavaScript infrastructure team. Um, I previously worked on the Instagram team when I lived in California, but switched when I moved to New York. Um, going to be talking about a lot of stuff that we've been able to open source over the past year and a half or so. Um, and I'm really thrilled about that because the parts that I've contributed are some of my best work. Um, and I'm really proud of the, the offering there. If you want to continue this conversation afterward, um, I am uh, Benjamin without the I on most forms of social media, GitHub, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Um, so yeah, uh, I am reprising this talk in part um, from two separate previous talks that I gave at Brooklyn JS um, a couple of months ago and last week at FluentConf. So this this hybrid talk goes into quite a bit more depth than either of those two talks. So one thing you may notice uh, is that I didn't bother capitalizing the title of my talk correctly because I didn't know how. Um, I had just forgotten like what the rules are about prepositions in, in titles and whether they should be capitalized. So like toward seems like maybe not capitalized, but then it's such a long word. Um, so of course I went to Wikipedia hoping to get this right, tried to read this article about letter case. Turns out they have a whole section just about headings and publication titles and how you should capitalize them. Um, and it turns out that there's just a host of conflicting ideas about how you should do this. And you can uh, become an expert, as I almost did until I gave up. And I kept looking, thankfully. Um, I found another website that I thought was really cool called titlecapitalization.com. <laughs> and instead of trying to explain to you what it's going to do or what the like reservations you should have about that might be, you just copy and paste your title into this text field. And it happens almost too quickly. It's done. It's capitalized for you. And you know, they decided not to capitalize for it, so that's what I would go with. There you can even see the rules if you really care, uh, which are somewhat simpler than Wikipedia. So it's a sort of a trivial example of um, a general case of the claim that I'm going to make tonight, that we have the opportunity as technologists to make certain kinds of problems just disappear forever. So whether it's title capitalization or uh, automatic memory management or self-driving cars, this is how you know, history is going to judge our efforts as people who talk to computers according to the number and uh, importance of problems that we made disappear, and also maybe the number and importance of new things that we made possible. So I find it, it often happens in the course of engineering that you have a bright idea, um, but it's, it's not quite complete, because the idea is that you should have been doing everything some other way all along. And that's, that's fine. It's, it's nice to have you know, remorse and shame about the past in a you know, productive way that might help you when you're starting from scratch in the future. Um, but that doesn't really help you if you're, if you're already working on a large project that you can't just start over with. Um, and so in order for the idea to be a really good and complete idea, not only do you have to have this insight, you also have to have some clever idea about how to pretend as if you could go back in time and have done everything differently. So I'm going to tell um, some stories tonight about how I had this insight and then I had to figure out a way of implementing it at Facebook um, and with their entertaining stories. Uh, so, let's see. I guess GitHub is a good example of a vast menagerie of such ideas. Better ways, definitely better ways of doing something according to someone's use case that just never got properly evangelized because it's a lot of effort really to explain to someone else why they should do things differently um, and why your use case is enough similar to theirs that you have anything to talk about. So there has to be a way forward from where you are right now with your bright idea about how things should have been. And Programming languages uh, like JavaScript, Python, any programming language that has attempted a very large step function to some new version 
that everyone should start using are notoriously difficult uh, as items of technology to, to fix forward in this way. Um, so if I can ask a slightly incendiary question, I mean, you know, too incendiary in, in this environment, but might be in others. It's been, uh, well, five years um, since Python 3 was first released and intended to be used. Why, why aren't people using it? Like, of those of you who use Python 3, or use Python at all. How many of you have ever used Python 3? Okay, I've got three hands. <laughs> um, I don't know what the base rate was, I guess. How many people have used Python ever? Maybe 60% of the audience. Okay, anyway. So Python is a great language. Python 2 is one of the most successful programming languages of all time. Um, and Python 3 fixes some things. Uh, but the migration is difficult, I claim, because there are all these things that you, new features of the language you'd like to be able to use, but then just a few features that are semantically different enough that actually ever getting around to that upgrade um, is just too difficult. So the Python people have this uh, script called two to three, which you can run over your code and that will like, convert all of the print keywords to print function calls, because that's something that changed. Um, and that's, you know, it's great but you don't have to do that by hand. Um, but Python 3 has also changed the semantics of Unicode handling. And I, this isn't a Python 3 talk, so I'm not going to go into that. But that turns out to be something where people have their solutions already, and it would be very difficult to adjust all of their code to accommodate those new assumptions. And that amounts to reason enough for most people in large projects like Django not to ever switch to Python 3. So, the more relevant question, perhaps, then, is how can ECMAScript 6, which is the technical name for the next version of JavaScript, avoid this Python 3 trap? So the crazy idea uh, that we're sort of testing at Facebook is that maybe you could ease into the new language by simulating its most useful features in the current version of JavaScript technically called ECMAScript 5. So why would you want to do this? Well, it gives you the opportunity to come up with these intermediate versions of the language that never necessarily exist for anyone else. But on a case-by-case -case basis, you can decide which new features of the language you want to use. And even if you never fully switch to the native implementation of the next version of the language, um, you, you still end up with pretty good code base that has a bunch of the benefits of that, that new version of language. So that's what we're doing at Facebook. Okay, so uh, if, if we're simulating features of, of the next version of the language, which features are we simulating? Well, we started out pretty modestly. One of them is this new syntax for what are called arrow functions. So in JavaScript, you write a lot of callback functions, so you see that function keyword with a parameter list and a function body after it all over the place. And arrow function syntax is an effort to make that more concise and also solve some of the problems with function binding that trip people up. And that's why we thought it would be a good idea to provide at Facebook. Um, I should mention uh, these, these slides are available online at uh, benjaminwithoutthei.github.io slash pivotal-meetup-talk. Um, and the reason I mention that is because if you do want to play with these examples, they are live editable. Um, so you can see as I change the input, it's changing the, the output. Okay, so what is an arrow function? Well, in this case, it's what's being passed is the argument to that sort function. So you may know that JavaScript has this quirk where if you have an array of numbers and you call sort without a custom comparison function, it turns them all into strings and sorts them in alphabetical order. So the ascending order for this array would be 1, 10, 28, 3. 
which is nonsense. Um, and so what you ought to do, if you care, is provide your own comparison function to make sure that the numbers are compared as numbers rather than as strings. So that's what we're doing here. The comparison function takes two variables, subtracts one from the other to get a, a negative or positive or zero number. Um, and that turns out to be enough to give us what we would expect, which is 1, 3, 10, 20, when we evaluate this. So the other nice feature of arrow functions, as you'll see, is that there is uh, this bind method being invoked on it. So that captures the value of this in the enclosing scope, which is something that people often forget to do or don't know how to do. Um, and so you just don't have to think about that when you're using the arrow function again. It's all in the name of uh, being concise. Okay, so how do you, like, you know, this, this is not legal JavaScript syntax right now at the end, but um, how do you make it available? So we have some tools that we use at Facebook that um, I've helped develop uh, that allow you to parse your code into an abstract syntax tree, which is just a, a tree of objects um, um, where each node corresponds to some piece of syntax, like a for loop or a function. Uh, or an array literal. And then um, you can traverse that tree. And whenever you find something that you're looking for, in this case, like an arrow function expression, you can modify it. So grab its body. And just in case the body is an expression instead of like you know, the curly brace delimited thing with a return statement inside of it. Um, then we turn it into a block statement, because that's what's legal in today's JavaScript. And then what we really want, instead of an arrow function expression, since that's not legal yet, is just a plain old function expression. So we copy all the stuff from the arrow function into a function expression. And then we call bind on that. And I guess uh, for the sake of the rest of the presentation being somewhat clear, I want to stress that what we're doing here is we're we're writing code. We're, we're building up the structure of some code. Now, this happens to be a very verbose way of doing basically what you do when you type on the keyboard and, and write code. Um, but, it's, but it's very similar. These block statements and function expressions and call expressions are what you would type with parentheses and, and dots and, and characters. Um, the benefit to this, even though it's so verbose, is that it's completely unambiguous, and it makes it easier to write algorithms that can transform the code, and that's the whole idea that we're going for here. And the last thing to do is just replace the original arrow function expression with the bind expression. Okay. So if you parse your code and do this traversal, and then reprint the code, you get back out the output with Nothing that isn't legal in today's JavaScript. Um, so, I mean, what I've just shown you is literally enough if you at least already have like a build step for static resources for you to start using arrow functions in your code today. So, if you're already using Browser uh, for instance, in, in building your, your static resources, then you're a short step away from having this ability. Okay, so that recast thing that I showed you is a tool um, that's meant to make this kind of traversal and modification a little bit easier. Um, and I came up with the, the name of it, uh, sort of proud of it. So it recursively traverses abstract syntax trees, so rec AST sort of makes sense, but recast is also a, a verb. Um, which means to give a metal object a different form by melting it down and reshaping it, or um, to you know, form, fashion, or arrange again every model or reconstruct, or supply like a theater work with new cats. So there's some poetry to it, too. <laughs> and the interface is, is also pretty delightfully simple. You just uh, require a cast, you parse a string of source code, which gives you an AST, you do anything you want with the AST, doesn't matter. Um, and then you, you print it back out. And the magic is that Recast will try to reuse original source code that wasn't um, affected by your modifications to the syntax tree. So to a very large extent, um, if there's some part of the file that you didn't touch, 
or some body of a function that you might have moved around because you can actually change the internals of the function. And that code just gets copied directly. Um, so you can use this tool to generate human readable diffs that are only um, changed in places that matter rather than great printing the whole file in some completely different style and losing comments and idiomatic white space and so forth. Um, the author of the parser that it depends on, the Esprima parser, is named Arya Hidia. He came up with a term for this technique. It's called non-destructive partial source transformation. Okay, so that was arrow functions. Um, and if you write code at Facebook in the JavaScript code base, you can use them today. Another uh, new feature of Atmosphere 6 is what's called rest parameters, which is sort of a solution for the awkwardness of the arguments object, if you've dealt with that. How many people have touched the arguments object in, in JavaScript? Okay, it's really it's a Node.js meetup. Good. Okay. So how does this work? You may have seen it before. Um, basically, one of your parameters in a function can uh, have a dot, dot, dot before it. And that will mean that that parameter will be an array that contains all of the remaining uh, arguments that were passed to the function. So this is uh, sort of like math.max um, with a kind of funny implementation. It goes through um, the second through however many uh, arguments that you passed. And if any of those is greater than the previous max, it uh, assigns a variable to, to the new value and then returns that at the end. Right? Um, OK, so what does this become? Well, uh, unfortunately, at, at the end of the day, we do have to use the arguments object, since that's the only way to get the unnamed arguments to the function. Um, so this generates code that. Uh, slices the arguments object to get a real array, um, excluding any of the actually named parameters. And then uh, you may have noticed that it's using an arrow function here as well for that for each callback that needs to become a normal uh, function expression. Um, it doesn't actually need to be bound in this case because it's not using this. Um, but yeah, I could, uh, just to show you that this is actually happening, change the name of that. Uh, Yes, parameter. All right. Any, any questions about this? Okay. Um, there's going to be time for, for questions later. Okay. So this is even more straightforward, actually, uh, given what we've already seen. We want to find all the functions that have rest parameters. We want to build up that chained member expression, the read prototype, that slice that call. It's really cumbersome, but at least you don't have to look at it. Um, and then the arguments are just that arguments object, just an identifier and a literal um, make a call expression out of those two things and assign the result of that call expression to a variable declaration that has the same name as the rest parameter. And then stick that new variable declaration at the beginning of the function. Um, and we don't uh, need a rest parameter anymore because we've simulated it. Okay. So that's rest parameters, another feature that's uh, available on our code base. Admittedly, like not the most you know, groundbreaking of, of uh, new features, but every little thing that keeps you from you know, cutting yourself on the sharp edges of JavaScript is, is nice. So something that is more impactful, especially given the sort of background and philosophy uh, that, that many engineers come to Facebook with, is that we are supporting the new uh, syntax for defining classes in ECMAScript 6. Um, so what we want to be writing is something that looks like Java or C++ or Python, where you have a class that extends a base class optionally, has some constructor, and its, its methods can invoke superclass overwritten versions of themselves and other methods. Um, so what does this become? if we're translating it back to JavaScript that we can actually use. Well, um, there needs to be a constructor function called derived. Um, and when it calls super, what it's really doing is invoking that uh, the base class constructor uh, with the argument. 
And then you got to set up the, the whole prototype chain, as you may know, because I've got create for that. Um, and so the instance of will work. This is an old like uh, legacy browser bug. You need to actually set the constructor property to be the constructor that uh, this prototype is attached to. And then methods like get value just become properties of the prototype. Uh, and calls to super, like super.getValue, become references to the, the base class. So in this case, base.prototype.getValue. Um, and then static methods are just uh, properties that are attached to the constructor itself. So that's, that's the goal. That's the hope. Um, so the, the actual transform here, uh, I'm not going to go through in this case, because it's a good deal more involved. There are a lot of uh, uh, sort of nasty bits to deal with, but the transform code that we actually use at Facebook is open source. Um, so if you look up the talk and click on this link, the you know, six class visitors class will tell you everything you ever wanted to know about how we thought it ought to be done. That, that project is called JS Transform. Jeff Morrison, my colleague, is the primary author of that. So. Uh, this is a bit of a lie. The, uh, you might hope that our, our old style of writing classes looked anything like this ECMAScript 5, but it doesn't. Um, our old classes actually looked at their best something like this. Uh, you would import this class module, um, which is for extending stuff, and then this copy properties function, which is sort of like object.extend, um, and then you, you copy a bunch of properties into the prototype or static properties onto the constructor. And uh, when you wanted to do something like super, you would say this stuff parent, which backed by this meta prototype thing um, that was like lazily populated with uh, methods uh, as implemented in the base class. Um, and I, what my ulterior motive um, in, in what I'm going to describe is getting rid of uh, all of that completely just making it disappear from the code base. Um, so uh, this code that you see now largely is, is nowhere to be found in the Facebook code base. And given that there were thousands upon thousands of places it was used, um, that, I guess, asks for some explanation. So the original plan here was just that we were going to add a, a JavaScript lint warning. Um, so that whenever you wrote new code that added properties to a prototype, it would yell at you and tell you you were probably doing something wrong. And then there'd be like maybe a, a link in that warning to some wiki article where you could read up on why you might be wrong. Um, and we were definitely, definitely going to like post in an internal Facebook group about the benefits of ES6 class syntax so that everyone would know. Um, and then just like wait for the diffs to roll in, and then it would be time to declare victory in 2020. So I thought, we thought this was wishful thinking. Um, because JSLint only tells you that your code might be bad after you've written it. When you've tested it, you happen to know that it's actually not bad, it's correct. Um, no one, almost no one, reads wiki articles unless they're actually just hopelessly stuck. You have to know that you're stuck in order to think that that's a good idea. And you don't always know that you're stuck when you're stuck. Um, and I, I didn't want to become that guy who has to you know, verbally tell thousands of Facebook engineers they should be doing something differently. It would have been, become my full-time job. So as long as an old style of doing something predominates in a code base, People are just going to continue writing new code in that style. Like this is the, the fundamental principle of how code gets written at large companies or in large code bases. And you'll just you'll never you'll never win. You'll, you'll never tip the balance in favor of the new style. It's just not going to happen. Okay. So we had lots of this stuff with class that extend and copy properties. We wanted more of this class derived extends super business. Um, and the reason we wanted more of that is so that we could shift something a little more sane and normal. Uh, so we're sort of coming back and forth from ES5 to ES6, ES5 again. But the, the net result is a consistent way of finding classes in JavaScript. We thought that was worthwhile. 
so we've solved this problem before, actually. Um, it's just a source transformation, although this time it's in the wrong direction. It's going um, from current day JavaScript to JavaScript of the future, which isn't supported yet until we write a transform to go back in the other direction. But the good thing about this kind of transform is we only need to do it once. Once we've transformed all our code and submitted those diffs and gotten people to uh, review the results of running the scripts, um, we're done. And we have what looks like ECMAScript 6. And it can be translated back into ECMAScript 5 when we serve up Facebook.com. Um, it's also tricky because uh, lots of slight variations on the idiom that I showed you of copy properties and class that extend. Sometimes we'll just assign and directly to the prototype, which is fine. Um, so if the script is going to be any use at all, it needs to sort of take care of a pretty long tail of different ways of defining classes. Um, I wanted to generate pretty code. Uh, that sort of looked as if it had been rewritten by hand so that I could actually, like, with a straight face, ask other people to review it. Um, and in consequence of that, the, the diffs were actually pretty human readable. I'll, I'll show an example. Um, and so I'm proud of that. Again, this is taking advantage of that idea of non destructive partial source transformation. So, as a personal anecdote, um, when I moved to New York and left the Instagram team, um, I sort of dragged my feet about finding a new team uh, in the Facebook New York office. And some people told me that I was crazy, but what I found out, or at least the hypothesis that I decided to test and see if I got fired or not, um, was that to a large extent, if you can provide a justification um, for what you're doing and get other people to talk about it, most importantly. Um, Facebook will let you work on whatever you think has impact, but you do have to be responsible for it actually having impact. So that was a great luxury. I ended up doing this project, um, and it led to my working on the JavaScript infrastructure team. So that worked out well. So the script took about a week to write initially, and then a, a while longer to, to tweak. But all told, um, it was responsible for modernizing a little north of 1,600 files in the code base uh, for about 150,000 combined insertions and deletions of code, which is a lot of code for a human to write in the space of a week or so. Um, but when you have a script to do it, it's in a much better uh, place. So the script only actually converted uh, 1,658 classes which is slightly more than the number of files, so you can probably sort of like have one class per file. Um, but I checked the other day to see how many classes there now are in the new style. So all of these additional classes will have been written by people who looked at the classes that they found in the code base and tried to do the same thing. And there are now 3,200 of those. So we've, we've doubled the number of classes that had to be originally converted and 1,600 new classes, like core pieces of logic in the Facebook.com um, code base, have, have been written by people who probably didn't read a wiki article, probably like didn't have to see that JavaScript went warning. They just looked at code that was lying around that happened to be what they should be writing, and wrote code like that. And everybody, well, in particular, I didn't have to lift a finger in, in that process. So here's an example of a diff uh, that's generated by that script. And you can see that it's getting rid of the imports of uh, class and copy properties, because those won't be needed anymore. Um, tag token becomes the, the name of a new class. I don't know if you can see this at all, actually. Uh, <laughs> we're getting rid of some stuff over here and getting some stuff over there. <laughs> the main thing I'd actually like to point out is that if you're tempted to do this kind of conversion with a tool that uses regular expressions, which is you know, often adequate as a tool, you're going to miss things like this down here. It's very difficult to know, just using a regular expression, that because we removed um, this parenthesis up here, 
And because this open curly brace is actually that now that open curly brace, not even associated with this object literal anymore. Knowing that you need to not have a closing parenthesis here is just very difficult to express in terms of regular expressions, uh, at least because it's just so much further down in the file. And this, this is a, a small example, uh, like the diff of the screen is mainly why I, I picked it. Um, oftentimes, the consequences of changes at the top of the file you know, don't happen for hundreds more lines down in the file. So actually having a tool that understands the structure of your code and can uh, do this conversion in a uh, sound way uh, ends up being pretty important. OK, so some of my lessons from, from this experience. Um, first, if you go with this effort to make the output of a script human readable, it's, it's amazing. People don't even question whether you wrote it. Um, so sometimes you end up having conversations with people about why it's probably too much effort to change your script, and that's the first time they've realized that you used a script instead of writing by hand. It would be totally reasonable to just tweak something if you didn't it by hand, but if you're using a script, you want the script to work in all cases. So, um, I guess that's more of a surprise than like a reusable lesson. So if, if you get excited about this and you start writing these sorts of transform scripts, you should definitely make sure that you, you fill them with fail-stop assertions. Like you're not going to be able to handle everything. Um, and it's going to really simplify your life if you can just say, you know what, at this point in the code, this has to be true, or I, I don't know what to do. right? And it might not be true. You might run it over some file, and then it might just fail. And that's fine. Just you know, leave the file like it was, and maybe come back later and do a better job of that edge case. Um, it's not important that a script like this be complete in the sense that it can handle everything, but it's really important that it be sound in the sense that when it thinks it succeeded, it actually did produce correct results. You really have to set yourself up to iterate rapidly, since it's just such a long tail of edge cases. Um, and like a large part of the project is just like <laughs> doing that mental calculus of, of whether I should fix this thing in ten different files or I should like teach the script how to fix it and run it over those ten files. So when when you get down to the like end of the tail, it's uh, it's maybe not that important to teach the script everything, but in a large code base, it really pays off to have a script that just uh, ends up knowing how to how to deal with lots of different cases. Um, What's, what's really cool is if the script actually handles most things, then you can change your mind as often as you like and just blow away the changes and then you run the script. And it's like you had done it that way all along. So if you do have to fix rare cases by hand, just stack them in separate commits so you can keep running the script on top of that. Um, really pays off if you go to the effort to make the transform, transform scripts Identitum, in the sense that if you keep running it on the same files, maybe it you know, made some changes earlier because it knew how to deal with one of the classes in the file, but it's another class that it doesn't know about. You don't want it to like screw itself up when it encounters code that it previously dealt with. So if you can write it in such a way that it like uh, finds the old stuff and recognizes it and leaves it untouched and just kind of like gracefully moves everything in the direction of uh, the way you want things to be, then you'll be much better off. Um, if, if somebody dragged you here uh, and you, you hate JavaScript and you learn nothing else from this talk, there's this really cool Unix tool called Parallel that lets you write scripts that just like take a single argument, operate on one file at a time, and then it just like does all the work for you, uh, running lots of copies of, of that script. In, uh, in, in different processes, uh, just really fully utilizing your, your hardware. So like here, uh, 228 seconds of, of sort of like real subjective time um, only took 12 seconds to execute. And I had a like shocking 1200% uh, CPU utilization. Usually you know that's 100 if you're like fully using your computer, but I had a lot of CPUs, so I want to take advantage of them. So GNU Parallel, look it up. It's generally not like installed by default, uh, but it's worth installing. Um, humans, 
always have the right of way in cases like this, um, which means if somebody's actually working on some code, like actually trying to improve Facebook.com, not just kind of like rearrange the furniture, um, you should always let them commit first. And then you can just rerun the script, right? It's like the best possible rebasing story because you can just instantaneously remake all of the changes that you had previously made, um, having accommodated whatever new stuff uh, was written. So you know, lean on that advantage. I, I made a mistake early on in, in this project. I guess it was hubris. I thought I was just going like, to get away with this, like you know, submit some diffs, and the people that I knew who understood what I was working on would just rubber stamp them, and they'd, they'd go in, and then we'd have no more of the old kinds of classes. Um, and that, uh, <laughs> that failed pretty hard uh, when people whose code I was touching for, for no discernible purpose other than to you know, change the language it was written in um, get mad. And rightfully so, because I hadn't identified all the stakeholders and I was trying to like convert whole swaths of code instead of you know, converting functional units at once. Um, so that's really important. It also means that like, as time goes by, you have all of these tasks and diffs to point to when you go to someone with uh, a new diff. And you can say, look, it worked over here. Everybody loves it. You know, there's no risk. And uh, for the most part, there really is no risk. Um, this is really generic advice, but yeah, milestones are important. Uh, filling off class to extent, this was my main like, intermediate milestone that didn't really require turning everything into a new style of class. Um, but since I had that to focus on, I could get there much more quickly. Um, so again, the fundamental law of large code bases is that new code mimics existing code. Uh, and so if you agree that the future is longer than the past, you've got to do something about that existing code if you want the new style of doing things to ever have a chance of being done well. So, I work on a project called React that actually uses the same technique to create or invent a new feature of JavaScript that's not going to be part of any future standard. And we, we don't even hope that it will be. Um, so I, I want to point out that this too is possible. If you have a bright idea that is not slated for universal adoption, you can still uh, modify the programming language that you're using and get the benefit of that. And so if you've used React, you may have guessed that I'm talking about the sort of like XML inside of JavaScript uh, syntax that we have. This too is live editable if you ever wanted to play with the JSX. Oh, yeah, can't see yet, but there it is. Um, right, so what looks like HTML on the top is getting turned into normal JavaScript function calls here. Um, and we do this because, well, a whole we'll slide about why we do it. Uh, the main reason, actually, is that there was huge benefit from adding similar syntax uh, to PHP internally at Facebook. And there's just a lot of value in having uh, you know, the same style of doing things both on the back end and on the front end. Um, but also, the this, this syntax that we introduce that doesn't exist in the language normally affords a layer of indirection. So we get to you know, be able to change our minds about how that's implemented, which is something that you always a luxury in computer science. Um, arguably, doing something like this, although it could be called forking the language, is a lot less aggressive than something like CoffeeScript or even most other templating languages that end up like restricting the language that you can use. JSX allows arbitrary JavaScript. You just also get some angle brackets. Um, and it's fine if JSX never becomes part of the ECMAScript standard. Uh, that's just not a goal of ours. It's a, it's a good technique that we've come up with. Uh, I'm not sure that it needs to you know, get widely adopted. Um, but if it does, then that's great too. OK, we could, though, perhaps express JS6 in real ECMAScript 6. Um, so just briefly, there is a proposed new feature for ECMAScript 6 called uh, template strings. Um, so this is what we have now. A template string would be a relatively small uh, 
change in front of the opening credit of braces, where we're interpolating values, you'd want to put a dollar sign, and then there are back ticks that surround the whole multi-line string, and you can uh, interpret the string with a custom function by, by putting an identifier just before the opening back tick, so you can see the, the JSX at the very beginning. Um, so, I mean, that's one way to do it, and that would be more in line with the direction that ES6 is actually headed in. Um, but, I don't know, I guess I would just ask you to you know, think about whether that's uh, really worthwhile. Uh, and if you have a good argument, then let me know, because we could totally just switch to this. It would be a non-destructive partial source transformation, I imagine. Okay. Um, so, as promised in the uh, summary of this talk, uh, another thing that I've worked on in the past six months or so, and that uh, Anja Masad is also here, my co worker, has helped me a lot with, is this project called Regenerator. It takes actually very complicated um, new feature that's been proposed for standardization in the next version of JavaScript's generator functions, uh, and the, the yield keyword, which is a way of writing iterators, basically, functions that can suspend themselves and then be resumed later. Um, and literally makes that available in today's JavaScript. So if you've used generators in Python or C Sharp, um, I think those are the languages that come to mind that already have them, then it's uh, quite a lot like that. OK, so I claim this is trickier. Here's a, <laughs> whenever anybody puts Fibonacci function up on a screen, um, some real contrived shit. Um, that they're about to go through, but it is actually a good uh, demonstration of what's involved with generators and, and making them available today. So this Fibonacci function just, you know, because it takes a limit, uh, and while the A variable is less than or equal to the limit, it yields that A variable, and then it updates uh, A to be uh, what B used to be, and updates B to be the sum of A and B, so it's that sequence of, of integers, 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, where each number is the sum of the, the previous two numbers. The next number would be 13, if we had the next in one. Right, so if we take Fibonacci of 10 and then call next repeatedly, the value that's attached to the little object that's returned from that will be the value that was yielded in each iteration of the loop. And then at the very end, we know that we're done because there's a done property that's returning to another object, and that becomes true, finally. Okay. So how hard could it be to translate this function into one that no longer contains that function star, which denotes it's a generator, or the yield keyword, which is not valid in JavaScript? Um, so this, I don't know if you can see the date on this tweet, but it was May of 2013, which was kind of a long time ago at this point. Um, I, I tweeted this in uh, another moment of hubris when I thought, hey, this is actually going pretty well, um, that I've been jokingly referring to this side project as my life's work for so long. I was terrified it might actually be finished soon. It was nowhere close to being finished. There were many iterations left, so many like, dead ends that had to be circumvented. So this was, I was wrong. Um, it's some of the trickiest code I've ever written, which may say more about me than about the code, but you know, just subjectively, I wouldn't do it again. I would. I would totally do it again. I know how to do it now. So, um, what's involved if we want to turn that Fibonacci function into something that actually works uh, in today's JavaScript? Okay, well, here's the, the same function just with the uh, curly brace kind of moved all the way down here to make some space. It's going to get longer, unfortunately. Um, so the first thing we want to do is take all of the variable declarations and move them up to the top of the function, which is actually how JavaScript behaves anyway. This is called variable hoisting. So this is not changing the semantics of anything. Um, so you can see we now have var a, b, and x at the top. And everything else below that is uh, just assignments to those variables. And so this, this doesn't really change anything, but what it lets us do is wrap the rest of the function in a generator function Again, doesn't seem like a huge win, but suddenly the Fibonacci function itself no longer has to be a generator. And this inner function expression um, can uh, now 
contain all of the yields um, and variable assignments that, that happen. Okay, so now we need to do something about this function. And I, I claim, although it may not be obvious, that this is now a simpler problem. Um, the body of the generator function needs to sort of simulate the execution of the, the function so that it can suspend and resume. Um, and so it does that with a switch statement inside of a loop. Uh, and the cases in this switch statement are like jump targets. So sort of like go to in a language that has go to. So in the first case, which is the one that we fall into because context.next is initialized to that, to zero initially, um, we just do the first part of the function that we saw before the while loop. So initialize a and b to the limit. And the second case that we just fall into is where we test the while loop condition and just in case that fails, if A is not less than or equal to the limit, this is how we jump around. We set context.next uh, to some other jump target, and then we break. And notice that that only breaks out of the switch statement. And it loops back around for another iteration of the while loop. Um, so if we did go there, oops, um, if we did go there, we'd be jumping down to this case 11 at the very end of the function, um, where we're going to stop and return. Um, but if uh, the while loop condition is not failing yet, then this is the this is the real need. The question you may have been asking yourselves: What do we do about the yield expression? Well, for that we set context.next to the place where we want to resume, and we return a value. And so what, what we've basically done is made it work to return a value. We use the return keyword instead of yield. So this is this return a is is what yield A used to be. Going to my picture. OK, so when we call next again, context.next will be 6, and we'll come right back here uh, to the place where we set next in A and B. Um, and then we fall through uh, to setting next to 3, so we're jumping back to the head of the loop. We're going to keep testing the, the while condition until it fails. So that's, that's what a loop becomes. It's sort of like eviscerated and strewn um, through your new function body. But at this point, we have no yields, we have no function stars. Um, so we're in pretty good shape. This looks a lot like JavaScript of today. Um, one more thing is that this context has to come from somewhere. So I'm going to sort of wave my hands here. Um, and you'll notice before returning that function expression, we pass it to this, this other function called wrap generator um, that returns a generator object that has the, the next method um, and is responsible for creating the, the context and making sure it gets passed in every time. All right, now it's time to picture. Um, that is pretty hairy, uh, but compared to other ways you might imagine of implementing generator functions, such as you know uh, continuation passing style or um, turning everything into promises. Um, what you end up with is, is a pretty simple, efficient state machine that you could, you could arguably use in production without having to apologize to anyone. There are no new function calls, and although the only sort of control structures we had here did contain yield statements, if you have a control structure like a while loop or um, a conditional that, that doesn't have any yields in it, it just gets emitted as it is. So there's, there's literally no change in the semantics of that code. So those things combine to make the, the generated code actually like reasonable as something you, you, could, you could use. Um, so what else can that context do? Um, I th think I'm going to leave this, these parts of the slides since they are somewhat self-explanatory to you if you're actually interested in this. It turns out that a lot of features need some support uh, from the runtime. Uh, you, you can already tell that like something is going on in the context.stop method. Well, here it is. We have to check and see if there are any unhandled exceptions that still need to be thrown before we return. And if so, throw them. Otherwise, just return the, the result. So when we call context.stop at the, the very bottom of the generator function, that's what it was doing. Um, proud of this example of for loops. Uh, So uh, before in loop, you need to get all the keys of an object um, and then loop over them. 
but you want to skip keys that uh, are no longer actually in the object, just in case you deleted some keys while you were iterating over the object. Um, so the context has this .keys method that returns a little iterator uh, that we can keep poking for, for new values, new keys. Um, and it'll be responsible for deciding if, if the key is actually still in the object. Um, and so that's just one example of how, although the generated code is, is quite a bit longer than the original code, it's a lot shorter than it would have been if it had to uh, uh, repeat the logic that's handled by the keys method of the runtime. I realize that's not an adequate explanation of what's going on there, but the, the slides themselves uh, Maybe more useful. Also, uh, you know, ping me on Twitter or, or what have you if you have any questions. Um, so there's this sort of announcement page that we put up about Regenerator when it was open source, facebook.github.io slash Regenerator. Um, it has a, a sandbox that you can play with that uh, shows you the, the results of uh, whatever code you type in live, um, and also has a, a button find a bug that you can use to uh, instantly populate the, the bug report form. Um, gotten a lot of bug reports that way. And I can go into a lot more detail offline, uh, but you know, obviously this project, Facebook's Regenerator project on GitHub is the final authority on how, how everything currently works. Um, in the, the last few minutes of this talk, though, I want to I talk about something much less technical, um, and that is how you stay motivated uh, to work on a side project that ends up being really difficult, especially when it's not directly related to your day job. And Regenerator was this for me. I was working on it by myself for a long time, not really making any progress on it because I would just um, forget where I was, you know, what things I was stuck on the last time. And when I did have time to pick it back up, there just wasn't enough um, context carried over from the previous time for me to like, really be productive and I ended up writing, you know, bugs, uh, just because I'd forgotten how I decided things should work the last time. Um, so if, if you're going to have a hard side project that takes a while, one thing that's absolutely important is you have to make sure that it stays fun. Um, so it's a little bit counterintuitive because tests are boring, but if, if you do write tests, then in, in the long run, uh, the side project will be so much more fun uh, because you'll just have this confidence that you haven't broken everything whenever you, you touch the code. Um, or you'll find out that you, you did break it and you'll, you'll know what you need to do immediately. Your work will be cut out for you. Um, this is also a little counterintuitive. Like, this is a side project, right? You don't have to just like, keep working on it until it's done. So you, you have to answer the question for yourself of when you're going to take breaks. And what I would argue is that you should take a break. You should like step away from the computer. Um, at those points where you know what you're going to do next, and, and you also know that you're not going to forget that because you've written it down. Um, and what that means is that even though you could have kept working, even though you could have done that thing that you knew was, was coming next, the next time you sit down to work on the side project, Thing will still be there. You'll be able to like jump right in and do that, and you'll you'll have that momentum at the beginning of the next session, rather than like never getting around to it because you're not entirely sure what you were you know, supposed to do. So that's a really good trick that you can you can play on yourself. Um, yeah. Uh, sometimes you want things to be a secret, but also it's good to like get people in on the secret. Don't be discouraged by similar projects. So maybe a little bit intellectually dishonest of me not to have mentioned that Google has a project called Tracer, which is an effort to uh, transpile a lot more features of ECMAScript 6 than Facebook is attempting into ECMAScript 5. And it's a pretty mature project, and you definitely use it. Um, and uh, I could have been discouraged by that by the existence of something that, that has limited support for generators um, already. Uh, but even though they had a head start, 
I had the advantage of knowing exactly where their support uh, had gotten to. And, and I knew that I could, I could do more things more correctly and that there was actually going to be a marginal benefit to my tackling this problem after they had. So in particular, in Regenerator, you can have a yield expression anywhere, literally anywhere, an um, expression can appear in the language, whereas in Tracer, Generator support is limited to uh, just expression statements or the, the right-hand side of assignment statements. And if you feel discouraged, uh, especially by the fact that you know, some other project may be doing a better job or something than you could ever do, uh, then realize that other people will probably be discouraged for the same reason. <laughs> and that's going to keep them from working on it. And so you, you have this like, you know, you might fail, um, but it's a side project. Uh, that means that gives you room to work on something um, without worrying too much that too many other people are going to be trying to do it at the same time. Um, so when should you ship a side project? Like, when is it done? Is it ever done? Um, what are you going to get out of shipping it that you might get sooner if you're willing to accept a you know, certain amount of bug reports? So again, day job projects have to be mostly correct when you ship them, especially to 1.2 billion users. Um, but that's just not the case for side projects. So my rule of thumb is you should ship as soon as you're confident that you can fix new problems quickly as they come in, but you're not going to be you know, overwhelmed if people start you know, both liking your stuff but then finding lots of problems in it. You don't want to get drowned by that. So it makes people feel great, uh, external contributors, to report real problems, even if they're kind of embarrassing. Um, Especially if they're straightforward to fix. That's just you know, one of the great experiences of, of open source social interactions is someone reporting a really serious problem and then you, know, you together finding an elegant solution to it. Everybody wins, even though the project probably wasn't as mature as you thought it was. Um, and you should definitely, you know, instead of fixing everything, just preemptively file known bugs. Um, and don't worry about fixing them before you ship. So at least when people find those bugs, you can point to the, the existing issue and say, yeah, I've always meant to get around to that. Maybe, maybe you should look at it. Um, by the same token, if you can make it really easy for people to contribute in small ways, then they will, which is awesome. So I had that reporter bug link in the, in the live sandbox, um, and like on the order of like 20 or 30 people clicked that and like submitted code that just wasn't working. Um, and I got to triage that and like found a lot of bugs, and, and I know that people spent like all of a minute filing those bug reports, which is pretty low friction for the value that it had for the project. Um, one of the things that, that made me think it was a good idea to build this in a world where Google's thing already existed was that in much the same way that it's difficult to upgrade your Python project to Python 3 from Python 2, using the Google runtime as sort of a, a large pill to swallow. You get a lot of great things, along with a lot of things you didn't particularly want. So this is one feature for generators, just generators. Um, so you can restrict the scope of your project that lets other people interoperate with it a lot more easily. Um, and that can be good, because then it's easier for people to make meaningful contributions, because your, your project isn't quite so monolithic. Um, GitHub is great because you can, you can do that Travis uh, continuous integration thing where it. How far did you uh, get the project before you found out about the Google stuff? Oh, uh, I, I knew about Tracer all along. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I was beginning to work on uh, Regenerator uh, happened at about the same time I first played with uh, the generator support in Tracer and, and thought to myself, I could maybe improve on it. Um, so yeah, I spent the, the there was no like uh, like a terrifying moment. Really. The, the question is, yeah. like, when do you make the decision whether to join another project or to start your own? Yeah. So. Okay. Um, I think I've already answered that at the end. Well, there's one more slide, so this we're actually really close. Um, so. The point here was just, um, if, if all your tests are passing and you've written a lot of tests, then 
we might as well go ahead and merge pull requests immediately so that people get you know that that good feeling. And then you know if you need to tweak it later, it's not like exactly up to the standard of style that you would use, then you can do that. You know, you control the project. It's really good to have other people's commits in this um, And finally, like this isn't always so easy, but if you can get non-technical friends excited about what you're working on, um, even if it's just, you know, they, they realize you're excited and they're you know, excited for you because you're excited, because your enthusiasm is, is infectious, that counts for a lot. Um, your technical friends, too, have emotions. Um, and if you can appeal to those, <laughs> then, uh, you know, they'll be, like, excited both by the technical side of things and by, like, the emotional, like, story that you're, you're trying to tell. And you are, yourself, maybe the best example of that. You have the same emotional needs and, you know, you're the primary audience for the story that you're telling. That story has to keep you going. I will now come back to your question. So the question was, when do you uh, make the decision to ship a new thing, even if it overlaps with existing things? OK. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll admit that there was like some sunk cost fallacy going on. I worked on it for a while. and. Uh, Thought I had an argument that it, it might be better, um, and I will say that like the reception on Hacker News and in the, the community validated that people were able to see both that there was some value in having just this one feature addressed individually, and that it was a slightly more thorough treatment of that one particular feature. Um, so you know, I I, I want to hear about people's experiences using Tracer. Certainly, if I come across people who are using it. Um, but I'm also excited to you know, help people. Like, if, if generators are like the main thing that they're excited about in the next version of JavaScript, um, I want to like you know, help them get that today instead of having to swallow the whole as a, a, a new version of the language. Yeah. I saw the one slide that you had with the uh, replacement for arguments with dot 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 rest. Yeah. Can you name that anything you want, or does it have to be rest? Yep. Be an identifier. Okay. Yeah. Can you repeat the questions when uh, oh, asking? Sure. Yeah, the question was just in the example where we had dot 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 rest, could you say like dot 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 args? And the answer is yes. It's, it's just like any other parameter, except there's this new token dot 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 that I think it does have to be the last parameter, but that's the only restriction. Yeah? Uh, yeah, okay. With the switch between uh, main ES6 code repo. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, um, I think the main thing that helped there was picking units of code to convert first. So the first projects that I, I tackled were like relatively small internal projects that weren't going to affect any users um, that had tests, which is that, that set of projects are actually very small at Facebook, unfortunately. And there were, nobody writes tests for internal projects. But there were a few of them, and it let me like work on the scripts and get it so that it was uh, like you know, it was producing accurate results. And so I could I could sort of persuade people to you know, kind of review and accept those diffs and wait and see if anything blew up. And I was able to move on from that to converting sort of larger internal projects like our tasks tool, which is actually really important inside of Facebook. Would have been bad for it to break, but it didn't because the script was in a, in a good state at that point. And only then was it really reasonable to start talking about, you know, converting things like the the web messenger client, which is has tasks, but you know, a lot of people use it every day. Um, so we needed to be able to point to a, a history of uh, successful conversions. Um, but once that was in place, and uh, you know. More and more people sort of knew what the technique involved here was. Um, it became easier and easier to justify it and for me to sleep at night knowing that it wasn't going to cause a blank Facebook.com page. Yeah. I mean, through generator features, 
Um, to the extent that's possible. Um, I mean, the, the features you want to convert. Yeah, uh, there are some edge cases, like the context parameter. There's no safety in place right now. It keeps you from like knowing what that's going to be called and clobbering it. But you sort of have to like write your code deliberately to screw that up. Um, it's also uh, going to be part of ECMAScript 6, for instance, in the same way that you can create a new function object using the capital F function constructor. There's going to be a, a generator function constructor um, where you pass like a string to it, basically eval that lets you use yield. Um, and I'm not going to support that, although technically I could, because that would involve bundling the whole compiler into the runtime. And right now the runtime is like 1,200 lines of code unmodified, and the whole compiler, like the parser and the reprinter and the, the, the transform and everything is like 500 kilobytes of code. So it's just not, you know, we're not gonna like add that to Facebook.com. Um, so that's the kind of feature that's like technically part of the spec, but just glossing over. So this is all about the um, stuff you don't want to do, stuff you want to do this, or something like that. It's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that could be better done than that. Yeah. Hey, uh, they gave me a microphone, so. Um, so, obviously, you have a lot of experience with like, compiler design, especially like compiler front end design, like lexing and parsing. Um, how did you first like explore that? Did you give like, people who were interested but don't know that much any resources where they can really dive into that, especially when it comes to like ECMAScript? Yeah. Um, I like that you said when it comes to ECMAScript, because uh, there's this huge springboard um, you can get started with, which is the Esprima JavaScript parser. And so it, you know, it's doing all the tokenizing, lensing, and um, parsing, coming up with uh, an ASP for you. And if you're comfortable working with you know, basically JSON, at that point, you, know, you can pick up and go crazy. Um, so the, the like early stages of, of parsing um, are, are largely abstracted away by that, and I, I definitely rely heavily on that. Um, the Aria PDF guy who wrote it, sort of like a hero of mine in, in the context of these projects. Um, so yeah, check that out, and in general, like look for tools that already exist. I didn't have to write, um, you know, Yak or, or Bison uh, style like language. Grammars because that, that had already been done. Um, it's good because the part that I was interested in was the, the transformation, less so than just parsing the code. So, thanks for your question. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, so, no other questions, uh, I'll you know, be around. And thanks a lot for uh, listening to an hour long talk about source transformation. Right. Yeah. Yeah.